We've seen a disturbing trend towards marital conflicts between husband and wife. Increasingly, couples struggle with breaking homes and shattered vows. From courtship to courtroom, from I do to I quit. The topic of my speech today is domestic harmony, dwelling in peace within our homes. Whether you're just starting out or you've been married together for years, the wisdom of the Holy Qur'an and personal example of the Holy Prophet Muhammad will serve you in good times and in bad. The verses that I opened with from the Holy Qur'an from Surah Al-Nisa translate as follows, and consort with them in kindness, and if you dislike them, it may be that you dislike a thing wherein Allah has placed much good. Similarly, the Holy Prophet ﷺ said that if you find a quality you dislike, you should look towards qualities that you like. In truth, there is no perfect boss, there is no perfect friend, there is no perfect spouse. We didn't always get along with our parents or with our siblings, but we all lived under the same roof and we managed to make it work. And we didn't even get to choose who our parents were going to be. We had no say in the matter of who our siblings were going to be, but we all managed to look past each other's weaknesses and we figured it out. Our relationship with our wives should be no different. Suddenly, when it comes to marriage, everyone becomes obsessed about their rights. And it gets so extreme that it reaches a breaking point. <clears throat> Everyone wants rights, but no one wants responsibilities. No one wants to hear about responsibilities, but these are two different things. One does not depend or is not contingent upon the other. If someone is depriving you of your rights, that has no bearing on whether you should or should not fulfill your responsibilities. You should always fulfill your responsibilities, regardless of whether you're getting your rights or not. Huzur Akta Sayyidullah said, <clears throat> Quote, Reg regrettably, goodness is demanded by others, but it is not practiced. So you should let go of this obsession you have with your rights and concern yourselves with your responsibilities. God will not ask you about whether you got your rights. He will ask you about your responsibilities and whether you fulfill them. And when both of you are thinking about what your responsibilities are and forget about what your rights are, then this becomes the formula for a peaceful home because then everybody's rights are being fulfilled. And if your behavior at home does not match the high standards of moral conduct, then Hazur says that you may be wasting your acts of worship, meaning that if you're good to God but bad to your spouse, then in fact you are not actually good to God. When we join this Jamaat, we all make a pledge, we all take a vow, and we know that we are going to face trials. We pledge to sacrifice our life, our time, our wealth, and our honor, and we know that it's going to be hard, and we remind ourselves that it's going to be hard. But that doesn't mean that when it does get hard, that we walk away, or that we just give up. We know that these things, these sacrifices, are what actually make it real. It makes our vow and our pledge meaningful. So say your, see your marriage vows in the same way. <clears throat> our parents didn't give up. They held on to their marriages, even though if at times it was less than perfect. They knew that seasons pass that years go by, times will be tough, the children will be small, they'll grow, they'll get out of the house, and then the pressure will ease, 
And as the Holy Quran says that surely there is ease after hardship. This was one good habit from our parents that we didn't pick up. Unfortunately, sometimes we pick up habits which are not good. But we should see those habits in our parents which are good and we should adopt them. Rather, what we've done is we've looked at the Western society and we found a bad habit and adopted it. We should adopt the good habits in Western society and also keep the good habits in our parents and then discard the bad habits that our parents may have had or the bad habits that we see from society. The Holy Quran says in the Sa'ukum Hathullakum, your wives are a tilth for you. The Holy Quran uses this met metaphor of tilth in the fields and reminds us that change comes about after we invest in the field. The tiller has to prepare the soil. He has to dig. He has to remove the gravel. He has to moisturize the soil. He has to fertilize it. He has to be patient. He has to give it time. And only then will you begin to see some sort of change eventually after much patience and hard work and sacrifice. This is the beauty of this verse referring to our wives and the garden that we can achieve through tilling the soil. So if you want to see a change in your wife, you will have to give in order to get. You will only reap what you sow. And if you are not reaping, then you should question your sowing methods. Grass is always greener where it is watered. You could leave your land for some other land. You could still, you could do that, but then at, at the end of the day, you will still have to prepare that soil. You will still have to toil. So you're better off trying to make this marriage work rather than, than trying your odds and finding another marriage only to realize that now you have to make that marriage work. When people divorce, they often say that we're not compatible and Hazur has said that people have begun to use this excuse too liberally. <clears throat> people say that they're not compatible, but do we ever ask, what about the child's place in all this compatibility? You have the right as a parent to ask, I'm not compatible, what about my compatibility? But does the child also not have a right to wonder the same thing? What is the child's compatibility with a step parent instead of their own biological parent? Or will he be compatible with being raised without a father at home? Is compatibility only for adults and not for children? These are questions because children can't ask these questions. They're too young. But couldn't a child also say that I don't get along with him or her? I'm sorry, you're gonna, um, you know, I, I'm not compatible. Ultimately, you will tell that child that you're gonna have to make it work, work. quote unquote, make it work. So it'll be either your child who's gonna have to make it work or you're gonna have to make it work. You can't have it both ways. So who will it be? Nothing can replace the love of a biological parent. Even a grandparent will give a child back to its biological parent when the diaper is full. There's nothing like your own biological parents. One Ahmadi confided, me, uh, confided to me that his marriage was on the brink of divorce, that he's having serious problems, and even his closest friend has, had told him that this is too much, you should end this, it's over. <clears throat> but then that friend of mine said he read a hadith which he said saved his marriage and changed the course of his life completely. Once a man came to the Holy Prophet ﷺ and asked permission to divorce his wife. And the Prophet, who knew the character of that lady, gave him permission. But then the Prophet asked, wait, do you have children? And that man replied, yes, I do. Then the Prophet replied, then no, go back and make this work. So then this friend of mine realized that he was putting his needs and his own wants before what Allah's word and instructions were. And he kept with it. And over time, his relationship with his wife began to improve. Research conducted at the UC Berkeley, um, University of uh, UC Berkeley found that children from divorced families struggle academically, socially. They're at a greater risk for mental illness and in more, they're more frequently in, involved in uh, crime and drug abuse. And this is 
These findings are corroborated by so many other studies. <clears throat> Staying married is not the solution in every house. There are reasonable causes for divorce, or otherwise Islam would not have permitted it after all. In fact, some marriages may even drag on for too long. However, the Holy Prophet ﷺ said that of all things allowed by God, divorce is the most displeasing of them all. There's even talk now in this trend that we are moving towards divorces in this country generally, that changing that we should change our traditional marriage vows that Americans use. From till death do us part, they want to change this to quote, as long as love shall last. How sad is this? If a company tried to sell you a phone and it told you that this phone will fail 50% of the time, would you buy it? Because that's the direction we'll get pulled into if we're not careful as a jamaat. One person describing the financial toll of a divorce described it as a non-fatal cancer. It is such a devastating financial blow to you if you get into a divorce. Some estimate that it could cost you $250,000 or more, some estimates. After all the, if you use the U.S. court system, child support, spousal support, attorney fees, division of savings, etc., etc. So you have to think about how, if you think you're having things tough now and life is difficult, it could be much harder. And sometimes we don't recognize what we already have and that the season will pass. What's more, the child now has four parents instead of two. Think about this from a Tirbiyat standpoint. It's hard enough for two parents to already agree on what's best for a child. Just imagine four parents. That child will not know which direction to turn. I've already mentioned mental illness, adverse social effects, um, fighting uh, that, that children uh, from divorce get themselves into. They're also at increased rates of divorce themselves later in life. And one piece of research showed that divorce is more devastating to the child than a death of a parent. Just how devastating is that? Psychologically and emotionally, the impact that a divorce has on your child is so much. Hazrat Ibn Masih al-Khamis said that if you want to reform your spouse, reform yourself. Improve yourself and she will follow or he will follow. That's the secret to marriage. Change yourself and gradually over time they will start adjusting themselves to your wants and your needs as well. Sociologists at the Department of Sociology at University of Chicago did an interesting study that showed that those people who divorce are not actually happier. Divorce from, unmarried, uh, from unhappy marriages. If you compare them to those, if you compare people who are unhappy in marriage and stay married with those who are unhappy and get divorced, you don't see any improvement of emotional well-being on average. It's about the same or slightly less. Which, by the way, those families that remain married unhappy didn't stay unhappy. Couples that said that they were unhappy, two-thirds of them later reported that they were happy with their marriage five years later. So sometimes it looks like you're stuck in a, in a rut, but it's really just a moment and it'll, and it'll pass. Before you were given, many of you serve in the Jama'at and <clears throat> Rara Jalsa, we have people who are given a lot of responsibilities. And before you were given any trust by the Jama'at, you had to earn that trust. And we know this in our workplaces as well. We all know that in our jobs, if we want respect, we have to earn that respect. You have to sacrifice. But unfortunately, in things that matter most, like our homes with our wives and in our children, we don't always do that. If you listened and tended to your family as carefully as you did to your clients at work, perhaps we'd have a lot less conflict. So if you want to be the king, you should treat her like the queen. Examples of love and tenderness between the Prophet ﷺ and his wives truly melt the heart. When the Prophet ﷺ got his first revelation, he was terrified. And if you've ever seen someone trembling, trembling the Holy Prophet ﷺ was trembling, and he went home to his wife, and Hazrat Khadija ﷺ wrapped him in a blanket, 
She consoled him, and she pledged to be his first companion. This was the close bond that they had, and the type of relationship that we should strive to have with our spouse as well. After the Holy Prophet ﷺ died, Hazrat Aisha couldn't bear to eat nice food. She once got some refined bread and she started crying. The bread got stuck in her throat and she said, Gosh, if only I could have shared this meal with the Holy Prophet ﷺ, whom she loved so much, but now she has to eat this alone. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was alive, would make Aisha blush by doing small little things. He would once, he would grab a, um, a cup from where she once drank and where her lips were, he would drink, he would turn the cup to where her, her lips were and would drink from the same spot. He would do these small things constantly to keep the marriage fresh. Once when Hazrat Aisha, who was of younger temperament, they were at a festival, she wanted to put her, rest her head on his shoulder and he let her do that. And at times when he was sad, he, it, it is said that he used to tap his wife's thigh and ask her to say something to cheer me up. The Holy Prophet ﷺ would say that to his wife. Another wife of his, Hazrat Mamuna, anha, said that when I die, I want to be buried at the spot where I first met the Holy Prophet ﷺ. And in fact, she was. She wanted her body to rest underneath that very soil where she first met him. My dear brothers, this is not the figment of someone's romantic imagination. This is a true love story which we should all strive toward. These are the anecdotes that we should warm our heart with because otherwise, and we should share these with our children because otherwise our children will take their lessons of love from other places. Ashuruhunna bil ma'roof, consort with them in kindness, says the Holy Quran. Allah says in the Holy Quran. No doubt women have many flaws. The Holy Prophet ﷺ even said that women have a tendency to be ungrateful. Even his wives at times felt jealous. They expressed their frustrations and moments of weakness. But also look at the example that the Holy Prophet ﷺ left for us on how to respond to those moments as well. <clears throat> he said, the best among you is the best towards his family. And I am the best among you in the treatment of my family. So then he took all of his wives' moods steadily. He didn't give in to them. He didn't make them feel bad for having them. He let those moments pass. And by themselves his wives corrected and they would apologize. He would never have to say anything. Parents could play a role in preventing divorce by picking spouses that match their children's values and by not forcing them into matches that their children don't want in the first place. And also by not hiding the truth about their child. Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran, Kulu Kaulun Sadib, speak the straightforward word. And this is repeated at the time of nikah, <clears throat> the time of marriage. Khalifa Sani told a story about a family struggling to find a rishta, a man struggling to find a rishta for his son, because his son was blind in one eye. So he says, I'm just going to lie about it. And he gets his son married to some girl and then tells her father after they're married that I'm sorry, sir, but you've lost this bargain. My son is blind in one eye. That man replied, I'm sorry for you. My daughter is terminally ill. So this is the unfortunate situation that some of us find ourselves in. It has nothing to do with taqwa. Taqwa is mentioned five times in the khutbah of Nakah. It's a very short khutbah and it's mentioned repeatedly. And you should apply the same taqwa after marriage as you do before marriage. Regarding joint family systems, Hazur says that, it, that if only, quote, um, if it only increases if joint family systems only increase you to commit sins, then it cannot be virtuous, and it cannot be a means to even serve your parents." End quote. We saw a case presented where two people came to the court for divorce, an Ahmadi boy and an Ahmadi girl. When the judge asked them to state the reason for the record for divorce, 
They couldn't give a reason. They were at a loss for words. They couldn't give a clear answer. They didn't have one. And afterwards, they spoke to each other, and they realized that neither one of them wanted the divorce. They were only pressurized by their parents all along. Hazur says, quote, this is why I advise that this is why advice is also a trust. Give advice that makes a home and not impart advice which breaks a home. <clears throat> Mothers and wives should realize that their calling is to prioritize their children over their careers. If one of the great, it's one of the great lies of man that he's, in, he's convinced women that she should measure her worth against his. The great power of women is not to lead man in the workplace. It is in building homes. Women have the role of building nations, and it is a higher calling than running a company or whatever your husband does. It's a crime that man has convinced you to measure your worth against his. You wield the power to build nations. You also possess the power to ruin nations. You can create a hell, and you can create a heaven. This is the true meaning of the hadith that paradise lies under the feet of mothers. That through good upbringing of children, our world becomes a paradise. That's your status. You can build a heaven on earth for us. Huzur Akhtas Ayyadullah said that, quote, rather than suffer from an inferiority complex, Ahmadi women should develop a mindset that they are better than others, end quote. So if you would like to work, then well and good, and by all means, may you flourish in your professions, but never at the expense of your children. Children are a trust of the nation, and they are the trust of the Jamaat. <clears throat> Salvation for you will not come from some hashtag movement. The fate of our country and our future is in your lap. In conclusion, you can till the soil, you can plant the seed, but who will send the rain? Who will pour the sunlight? Who is it that commands the plant to sprout? You must pray. The Prophet Islam says, a home in which prayers are offered regularly is never destroyed by God. Difficulties in relationships does not mean that you are not compatible. It's an opportunity to learn each other better and to strengthen the relationship through the resolution of that conflict. <clears throat> the bone that is broken is actually the strongest where it is healed. So keep faith and stay positive and heed good advice and ignore bad advice and heed the example of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. And you only get one family. And always remember this. Tend to your soil. Women, be compliant with your wives. Allah says in the Holy Quran, wamuna ala nisa. Men are guardians over women. The Holy Prophet ﷺ says the most pious of people is the one who refrains from arguing even if he is right. So remember that hardship in marriage is a season that shall pass. <clears throat> to the young couples, your relationships are more fragile than you think. No one ever thinks that this could happen to them, so please do heed this advice. وَأَخْرُ دَوَانَا أَنَّ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ